I understand you like calling yourself an entertainer rather than a musician. What is that job for you then? Uh, to be entertaining. <laughs> As opposed to musician, and as uh, someone who uh, is basically involved with playing an instrument for a living, entertainer is usually somebody who doesn't necessarily involve themselves in playing an instrument but entertains through singing or dancing or telling jokes or juggling. <laughs> Do you think singers are not really musicians? Not necessarily. Uh, it, I, I think that actually a singer can be more of a musician than a musician. It's just the, uh, I guess it's just to uh, take the stigma of being called a musician away from <laughs> It doesn't have a very good sound these days. What is that? Well, I don't know exactly. It, uh, it Doesn't it conjure up that kind of an image in your mind? What, negative? Negative. Musician? Musician. Mm, I think actually less so these days. Well, for one thing, it's very limiting. Uh, the other, it's... Uh, I think that the uh, probably the abundance of musicians might have had something to do with it. There's so many musicians out there and most of the definitions fall usually in uh, people in the, very, in the popular field of musical bands, groups, because there's so many acts like that. The immediate image of a musician, I think, is somebody belonging in that category. Uh, otherwise, they're referred to in other ways, you know, classical. It's just, uh, that's one aspect. The other is that I don't really concern myself with the business of playing instruments as, a, as necessarily what I do. So for that reason, I'm more than anything of a musician. The other thing is a musician is, is a person who accompanies other people, which is something I seldom if ever do. So you would think that the term entertainer would be, uh, shall we say, more well-rounded? A musician is more limited. Well, it's more appropriate for what I do because I, mean, I don't, I'm not in a position for that. I don't appear on other people's records as playing a guitar or a piano or, or, or anything else. If I do, it's usually for the purpose of singing, and that's uh, this kind of a middle of ground between my entertainer and musician. Basically, what you do is mine a particular uh, era of music. The bulk of your stuff is from the around the turn of the century. Well, it just seems that, that way only because it is that way, not because it's, it is, it's uh, specifically a, uh, a niche that I've carved for myself. It's not a conceptual thing, it's just the way it is. It, it's more like maybe you were more attracted to that music than it was an effort to, like you say, carve out a niche? Right. Well, it's not so much attracted to that music as it is that that's the kind of music that, that attracted me and uh, was available to me and what the kind of music that I listen to uh, tends to be more consistent with my character than uh, doing anything else uh, only because it's the only thing that I've ever been involved with. Well, what is it about that music that attracts you? Uh, it, it's not even a question of that. It's just, it's just that it's... What is it about music that attracts me to music? As, as far as music goes, I was interested in music in the earlier period with the uh, classical composers of Paganini, Chopin, Beethoven, Franz Liszt, and progressed to this kind of music. I'm actually moving forward. It's, it's in keeping with, with the way I think, mainly. It's more natural. It tends to be... Uh, it tends to be more uh, in harmony with nature than it is with uh, in making any kind of statement or, or, or perhaps any radical statement or just trying to be plain ugly, which is what I hear most, uh, most music of today, I guess, most music in general is that it tends to try and emphasize the ugly part of life. It's more base. It's not, it's not as, it does, the idea does not seem to be uh, to 
provoke any kind of thinking. Quite the opposite is uh, it's verbal abuse of some kind, and verbal and audible abuse. Just the way I say, the way I hear it. But uh, you know, to somebody else it might be uh, ambrosia. I don't know. Uh, are you talking like uh, all this heavy metal stuff, rap, all that kind of thing? Well, not even that. Even country music of today is something that's quite annoying to me, although that's probably the only area of musical category which can be very uh, consistent with you know, what I like consider to be something that at least is sending some kind of a, a pleasing uh, uh, message to me audibly. But even even most, mo most of that music depends to be on the... Uh, cliche side, you know, it's all based on the same concept, which is to create some kind of a rhythm track, uh, and a very loud one at that, and then just keep piling sounds on top of it. I guess the one main criticism that I have is, is the fact that you you hear the, the most dominant thing that you hear in all recordings is a very live and loud rhythm track, which I think is completely unnecessary. It just brings everything down to its base element, and it uh, it restricts the concept of free thought while you're listening to the music, because it keeps pounding in your ear, and it prevents you from, it prevents the idea of being able to uh, somehow uh, drift out of it, you know, you, you can't, you can't create mood if, if there's a consistent beat going in your ear, I, at least I can't do it. So let's turn that around, then what, what kind of mood attracts you then? How would you define what it is about the music that you play that attracts you? Mood is uh, something which, which is different to everybody, but at the same time there's a common bond in how people think. People don't usually think in, uh, on a construction site with a lot of things going on, people running around, and, uh, a lot of noise and uh, distractions. Uh, I think people usually do their best thinking when there's a, there's a, there's a focus uh, which is uh, tends to allow you to uh, collect all of your thoughts and uh, be able to focus rather than being distracted. And uh, usually if it's uh, any kind of uh, blatant noise or a fast movement or is like less likely to create a mood for thought than if it was something, in the case of music, which had a, a soft transition, which would invoke some uh, thought process which is more consistent with uh, uh, reflection, be reflective. Uh, that's basically what it is. I mean, let's face it, most of the music that you hear is basically designed for people to either nod their head, tap their foot, or uh, or dance to. And, you know, if you're dancing, you're not exactly, you know, you're, you're in a different mode altogether. You're not trying to be reflective. It's basically just a visceral reaction to what's happening. Uh, it's being completely in contact with the physical world. My idea of music is trying to create an area of the mind which is, uh, in other words, uh, going to the metaphysical world rather than get down to base, uh, base response. More like impression than expression, maybe. Right, I think that's mostly, I think, the reason why I was attracted to the music, uh, classical music of the Romantic period is that that, was, that is essentially what that was all about. Uh, the music is very consistent. Listen to Chopin, you know, you don't start dancing. Uh, it's very reflective. It, it allows you to think, and, uh, and it's very pleasing. It can also be very exciting, too, but it's, also, it's exciting not on a physical plane, but, uh, you know, the metaphysical plane. That's where you got your jump off, then, was uh, checking out the Romantic period. Well, it's just consistent with how my mind works. But it may have some people might like the the idea of uh, having living a very physical life. I mean, there's uh, there's room for it, obviously, in anybody's life. But I think that it's a very small portion compared to the uh, the less physical things in life. 
What do you think about the uh, innovation of MTV and putting uh, music and video together as a product? Well, unfortunately, that more or less reflects exactly what it, what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Is that it? It has it has rooted its way down to its base level, which is practically 99% physical. And they do that in the obvious way, which is to exploit sex. Uh, and the visual images are basically very provocative and sexual in nature, which is a complete but devoid of any uh, reflective uh, thinking at all. I think there's room for it to create some other uh, uh, concepts too, but I think that when you when you get uh, business and uh, the uncreative world of creation, of being creative or trying to be creative, the uh, you know you have to compromise, and uh, the more you compromise, the more the more physical things get, because that's the most immediate response. Because the physical gratifications are immediate, therefore that trans uh, translates into. Uh, uh, videos which amplify the, the physical gratifications of life, which has a more immediate return, a more immediate bristle reactions. That's why you have uh, uh, very attractive young girls with tight dresses and uh, close-ups of uh, the anatomy, and then you uh, uh, connect that with music because it gets the base response from base mentality, and this is how people uh, conduct themselves, and it's a self-perpetuating thing where it just gets worse and worse. The less you think, the more physical you are. I have to admit, this is a real different conversation compared to most people I talk with. Most people are trying to get people excited in that base way. Because you know. it's the most, uh, it's the easiest way to get response from people. But the unfortunate thing about it is that it, it has a very shallow return. It it can only create a uh, an even it's a far, it's a diminishing return is what it is because you're putting less into it uh, and this is the, I think this is a basic problem with the entire country not again this has nothing to do with uh, uh, music TV uh, uh, it has to do with how people are thinking and people are thinking in the most uh, uh, lowest common denominator level which has the least return. It's a consumer environment that we live in. It's the give me kind of a generation where they have to have things. It's difficult to convince people that if they uh, if they sacrifice, if they do without, if they do without the gratifications of the physical world, they're likely to get something more out of it. Very difficult concept. It's almost impossible, as a matter of fact. And then what has happened uh, in recent times is that the balance is now tipped and the message to the people is that you deserve the physical gratifications and as much of it as you can handle or your uh, budget can handle and even if your budget can't handle we're going to advance your money it's a vicious cycle and it's a cycle which has as I say no return less and less and this is the basic decay of a society the downfall, it was the downfall of the Roman Empire, and it's going to be the downfall of the Western world. Is that people are basically base creatures who react to physical uh, stimulation. And, and when you have industry and uh, commerce uh, jumps on the bandwagon and uh, all for the purpose of creating more revenue for themselves, have to conduct themselves accordingly, so they find the niche. The niche is to convince people to buy more, spend more, think less, and that ultimately leads to the decline of any uh, any civilization on this planet. It's been going on for hundreds of thousands of years. Do you give people different ways of thinking then? Well, I have, uh, this, this is just my view as, as, as the non-entertainer. If I started to talk about this sort of thing in front of people, I'd, 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 eyes would be rolling. Especially uh, in uh, bars and things, so where especially, of course, pretty you know, pretty base operation there. Exactly. Not to say everybody's like that, but I think anybody who gets caught up in that environment it has to you know, talk, convince themselves that that is indeed what they're doing. Is they're they are abandoning any thought process in return for 
stimulation of some kind, whether it's a suppressant or a stimulant, it's the same thing, because it takes the two extremes, which uh, tend to be less reflective. I mean, it takes away from reflection, whether you're stimulating your 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 your, your body or your or your suppressing it. it it's the same thing. How do you feel about uh, things like? The anti-drug war. I think it's just a symptom of, of what what I've what I've just said. That it really has nothing to do. It's it's the whenever you leave yourself susceptible and available to this kind of thinking, then it, it follows that you either have uh, uh, somebody will take advantage of it. it. Doesn't and it really doesn't make any difference if it's the government taking advantage of the people, or if it's a group of. Uh, very powerful entrepreneurs who want to take advantage of the situation. It isn't these people, because these people are part of society. They're all the, all the parasites have always been a part of society. They are the, the people who are simply innovative in their uh, concept of survival. They will simply supply uh, anything that the uh, mass will consume. The mass will only consume it if they have no, basically no self-respect, they have uh, lost their focus, they, they amplify their physical needs. If you emphasize this part in society, you will end up with people who want to partake of anything which will hasten their decline, whether it's alcohol, drugs, or whatever, it doesn't make any difference what it is. So the, the war, the emphasis on it should be to purge the system, to cleanse the society as a whole, rather than chasing your tail. The evil and corruption is, is a part of human nature. You can't stamp that out, so it's, it's a completely useless concept. The concept is to turn people's thinking around. And you can't do that if you have a society which says that you should have as much physical stimulation as you want, because it's a free world, it's a free uh, uh, spirited uh, uh, concept, and everybody should, should have as much as they like. This is the message which is sent out, and it is uh, also the message which apparently in its uh, recent translation of the uh, Constitution allows everybody to have everything that they want, not to be deprived, to have all the stimulation. Well, that naturally, if you extend that thought, you end up with uh, that they should also indulge in whatever stimulates them physically. So that's, that's where the drugs come in. So what would you think would be the uh, flip side of that? Uh, how, how would it be possible for people to think differently? Or, you know, well, do you, do you have any suggestions there? I think the, fl the flip side, of course, is a dictatorship. Which, which dictates to the people what they should and should not do and enforces it. Now, that, of course, is the other extreme. There is nothing that will work. Everything is a balance of what it is. In this case, the balance is the uh, allowing freedom, uh, freedom to the li most liberal sense, to allow everybody basically to have a, uh, a non-caste system and they can uh, simply exist on, on any level they want. At the same time, you have a, uh, a police uh, force, a, a system of enforcing the laws of the country, which in ultimately will end up being totally contradictory to what the actual message of the country is. So the effectiveness of it becomes inconsistent, and it becomes a hypocrisy, in other words. So what you have to end up with is a form of uh, mass censorship, which is consistent with how the country, how the conscience and the moral state of the country dictates. And you can only do that by force, and you can only do it by a majority, a moral majority, assuming you can figure out what that is. You have to suppress all the things which are inconsistent with moral behavior. You have to suppress the physical aspects of stimulation of society, and you have to 
substitute that with something which counteracts it, which has to be something which is uh, uh, considered uh, thought-provoking, but at the same time maintaining a moral sta uh, standing. And again, you're, now you're dealing in dangerous ground because the Constitution, as it is uh, translated these days, and it seems to be translations, of course, a very interesting thing because it, I mean, it depends on who's translating it. History is, uh, is merely uh, uh, a concept of whoever it is who's writing history or rereading history or translating it. It's the latest version of history, in other words. Just as history changes, uh, so does the uh, 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 any uh, declaration uh, that's conceived of at any point, given point in history. So the modern way of uh, uh, modern approach to it is simply to uh, uh, translate it in modern terms, which may be completely inconsistent, unacceptable of the original literature. But again, there's a, there's a lot of leeway in translating things. Well, how do you feel about something like the NEA trying to come up with that uh, guidelines? It seems to me that this, this country is, is led by uh, a, a certain liberal faction which seems to be uh, hell-bent on, uh, on moral decay. And, and it's and it's one thing if people want to express themselves. Uh, it's another thing to uh, to make that the accepted form. And especially if government is going to fund something. Again, I, you know, I, I'm, let's just say this, put it this way, I'm entirely in favor of censorship as long as I'm a censor. <laughs> And uh, then you'll have to figure out who I am, you know, in, in general. Uh, who, who is the person who wants to censor it, and what, what is the uh, basis of it, and what is the ultimate purpose of it? Here's the other problem, or the way I see it, is that it is all based on legalese nonsense, which is, uh, but unfortunately that's the way it's going, is that every, every any time somebody opens the... Uh, uh, or creates a precedent, regardless of how unrelated it may seem at the time, it is somehow uh, it somehow has an effect on so many different areas which really which really should not be affected by that particular precedent. That, as I see it, is, is, a, is a major problem. Uh, they're trying to create absolute uh, laws, in other words. There's no such thing. Well, it's just like what you were saying with uh, history. Actually, laws change as time exactly. goes. Exactly. Now they've, they've tipped the scale to the point where it's uh, it, it's seemingly totally absurd, but it creates a lot of revenue for lawyers. Let's come back to music. How does uh, music, your music, fit in with your feelings about the society and well, what's going on? I don't, I don't know if the music, the music that I perform has anything to do with it. Uh, music, on, on the whole, was, was all, always a self-indulgent thing out for me. I mean, that's, that's all it was, basically all it is. It's just an artistic expression of uh, what I like and uh, how I how I hear order in music. And it's just creating a mood. That's all it is. It's not a social statement. It's not to recreate a period. It just happens to be the mood that I like to create for myself, uh, mostly for my listening pleasure, not. You know, listening to that kind of music in quotes. And it isn't really that kind of music for me, it's just absolutely the music that I like. So this is more of a, a taste matter than musicology, really? Mainly, but of course, you know, the longer you do something, you tend to acquire a certain knowledge. Perhaps a lot of people have forgotten or died off, so you, know, you end up becoming a historian by virtue of uh, uh, you know, circumstance. Well, I understand you've been uh, researching Emmett Miller, for instance. Yes, I have. I have. The only missing puzzle in that uh, scenario there is uh, is the uh, is his girlfriend from the twenties. What is it about Miller that fascinates you? He, he was the consummate uh, blackface minstrel show performer, uh, uh, an eccentric singer and a, and a, and a song stylist, and a very strong stylist who was very influential in introducing a lot of standard tunes and, uh, on the stage, but he never got the credit for it. 
I think a combination of all of that, plus the lifestyle he led, the fact that he was a, uh, had an unfortunate life, and he was a boozer, the, the self-destructive thing, you know, which is uh, an unfortunate thing. It repeats itself. It's not an unusual thing, certainly. But the fact that a person could be that uh, uh, influential and at the same time uh, lose or not have any recognition at all has to do with the person's uh, inability to function in a in society. In other words, not being compl completely, not being in touch with what what his potential was. Uh, I think a lot of that has to do with abuse. You know, obviously he's a drunk, so that you know, didn't help his case any. When you do some of these songs from, say, the turn of the century, do you think there are curiosities today? How do you feel has been the, the like the staying power of that music? I think that. It depends on the song, of course, but the standards from that period survive for... Uh, you take a song like Shine on Harvest Moon, which was written in 1907, which is still enjoyed by many people today. It's a... Uh, the, the generality of, of the lyrics is... Uh, that's what makes a real song. There were a lot of songs written in that time which you wouldn't want to talk, I mean, you wouldn't want to sing, because they're designed for the period, uh, novelty numbers, and, and they really don't go any further than that. But there are a lot of st songs which are standard, uh, which have stood the test of time, and uh, and that's the that's the kind of song that, that I think I'm attracted to the most, is a song which does not have, which is, has a timeless quality to it. The words are not necessarily words are not dated, the melody is not necessarily dated, or certainly depending on who we're listening to it. That's what appeals to me the most, uh, you know, for recording purposes, but I also happen to like a lot of the uh, period songs, which are, which are entirely dated. But that's because that's, you know, my taste in music tends to be in that category, so I don't see a problem with it. But I can be objective and uh, recognize that some tunes simply uh, are and would sound like they were dated, and there are some tunes which are completely uh, uh, their standard songs. Uh, they, would, they would be just as valid in the next century as they might have uh, when they were written. So you're in Whitefish, Montana? Uh-huh. You're actually touring some odd little places here. Uh, Woonsocket, Rhode Island. Uh, huh? Scenic tour. Uh huh. That's what it is. And you're seeing a good bit of the country. Well, Montana ought to be well, spectacular I, now. This is the uh, spot tour for vacation land, I guess. That's what it is. Have you had any interesting experiences on the road? Is there any good good road stories you can tell no, me? No, I, I try not to have any. 